Love was a recurring topic in all of Lennon McCartney's songs until 1965. Some songs explore this theme more than others, such as If I Fell and You Can't Do That. But by rubber soul time, after experiencing acid and the changing tide of the 60s, the time had come to expand, and no one was better than John to do so. The Beatles would go on to greater and better things after Nowhere Man set the pattern. After Help and I'm a Loser, Nowhere Man is the third of John's admissions of his own sense of inadequacy. It's a commentary of himself during his Fat Elvis phase, separated from reality, feeling the need to project a public persona predetermined by Beatlemania, lost in the multi-room seclusion of his mansion, and progressively destroying his identity with a ruining tide of drugs. Towards the end of the production for Rubber Soul, John and Paul had difficulties in coming up with new songs. Similar to Paul's Yesterday, Nowhere Man seems to have been received by John by divine inspiration. I spent five hours that morning trying to write a, a song with that was meaningful and good and, and I finally gave up and lay down and Nowhere Man came words and music, the whole damn thing, as I lay down in the other room away from where I wrote the songs. I thought of myself as Nowhere Man, sitting in his nowhere land, John said about writing it. He told me later that he'd written it about himself, Paul once revealed about the track, feeling like he wasn't going anywhere. I think it was actually about the state of his marriage. It was in a period where he was a bit dissatisfied with what was going on. He treated it as a third person song, but he was clever enough to say, isn't he a bit like you and me? Me being the final word. That was one of John's better ones. As was common during these sessions, amazing songs were being completed left and right and Nowhere Man was completed in just two days. After rehearsing for a while, the Beatles went into AMI Studio 2 on October 21st, 1965, the sixth day of recording Rubber Soul, to begin work on it. According to author Mark Lewison's account in the Beatles recording sessions, the original arrangement had a complex idea to open the song with John, Paul and George performing high register three-part harmony. You should talk in a higher voice because the camera makes you sound weird. Higher? Okay. I have come to the conclusion that the Sabre Corporation may, yeah. may be overlooking certain safety regulations. This idea would be later abandoned. But after two failed attempts, it was apparent that they needed to rethink the arrangement and start from scratch. They returned to EMI Studio 2 the following day, October 22nd, for a nine-hour session to finish Nowhere Man, with John providing acoustic rhythm guitar, Paul bass and Ringo drums. George seems to have sat out the entire rhythm track, as there is only one acoustic guitar heard. Take 4 was deemed the best. Overdubbing then started, first emphasizing the vocal harmonies of John, Paul and George with the help of George Martin's arranging skills. It was agreed to do the introduction in their usual vocal ranges a cappella, scratching the high register harmonies idea from the previous day. Since the song ultimately revolves around the vocals, John, Paul and George all double track their parts afterward to provide even more depth. George then added electric guitar phrases to the conclusion of every verse and bridge. By the time to do the guitar solo overdub, George and John had actually played it in unison through two small amps on their identical Sonic Blue Fender Stratocasters with a microphone sitting between the amps. Years and years later, while recording the album Double Fantasy, John reused the same technique for the guitar solo of I'm Losing You. I played that strat a lot on that album, George once commented. By this time, the Beatles were becoming more and more audacious in the studio, pushing for a more brash sound for their guitars. For us, the worst thing was to be bored. We're young, 20 year olds. Um, and we've already got some success. So we've got the excitement of youth and the sort of speed of youth. Yeah. And a lot of the engineers have come up with us. Yeah. So they knew how stupid we were and how cheeky we were and how you know, ambitious we were. And it rubbed off, saying to him, come on, get more of this, more of this, more of this, more of this. 
that he'd kind of, you know, they'd get a little look on their face like, we're all naughty boys. We're going to actually break a few rules here. Yeah. And if it worked, we'd yeah. go, yes. You remember the song called Nowhere Man? We wanted like a really cutting electric guitar sound. So the engineers sort of put full treble on it. And we said, no, can you do more? They said, well, no, that, that's it. So well, what about if you took that and put it over to this set of EQs? Couldn't you do, do it all again? Wow. And they'd go, well, you know. <laughs> so we'd have them go through a few channels each time, putting this treble on it have a bit more freedom and allow ourselves more freedom and George Martin allowed us more freedom. So we could then kind of push the envelope a bit. After that, the song was all done. Another classic made in just two days. It's interesting to note that Nowhere Man was played during the Beatles' last live concert at Candlestick Park on August 29th, 1966. About this performance, their press officer at the time, Tony Barrow, recalls, There was a sort of end of term spirit thing going on, and there was also this kind of feeling amongst all of us around the Beatles, that this might just be the last concert that they will ever do. I remember Paul casually at the very last minute saying, have you got your cassette recorded with you? And I said, yes, of course. Paul then said, tape it, will you? Tape the show, which I did, literally just holding the microphone up in the middle of the field. As a personal souvenir of the occasion, it was a very nice thing to have. This recording has been available on bootleg releases over the years. In hindsight, this groundbreaking yet simple song that emerged from John's existential crisis seems very profound and all-encompassing lyrically. As the Beatle who followed the trend of expressing his feelings and views through his tunes, John was ready to move past the pop song formula, and after Nowhere Man, nothing was the same. The whole Beatle thing was just beyond comprehension, and I was eating and drinking like a pig, and I was fat as a pig, dissatisfied with myself, and subconsciously was crying for help. I think everything that comes out of the songs, even Paul's songs now, which are apparently about nothing, the same way as calligraphy show, and your handwriting shows everything about yourself. Or Dylan too, Dylan might try to hide in the subterfuge of clever Allen uh, Ginsberg type words or hippie words, but it was always apparent what, if you look below the surface what is being said, resentfulness or love or hate, and it's apparent in all work. Yeah. It's just harder to see when it's written in gobbledygook. Hey guys, Gus here. I hope you liked this video. I'm here to ask you to click the like button, comment, and share this video with your friends. It's really important to me. See you next time.